Welcome to the Inquisitive Room Podcast. I'm Shaw, your host. This is a podcast that brings interviews and insights from all walks of life from a bird's eye view on the reality of being. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. If you're new to the podcast, thank you so much for joining today. And if you're returning, thank you, thank you, thank you for your continuing support. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with someone about mental health. And as you all know, it's the reason why I started the podcast, really, to speak to people about how they navigate their way through life through life's ups and downs, challenges, and also joys and happiness and achievements. We learn from all of it, I believe, anyway. Today, I'm joined by Leif Gregerson, and it is pronounced Leif. It's not Leif like the 70s rock star, uh, maybe 80s as well. I think it was 70s rock star uh, Leif Garrett. This is pronounced Leif. So Leif Gregerson joins me today to talk about his own journey and how he sought support and help with mental health issues. Leif is from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and he describes himself as somebody who grew up with quirks and personality flaws. And I, we do talk about that. I ask him about those things, but, but he does describe himself as getting older and some of those quirks faded away, but then again, some emerged again when he was an air cadet and he found that he had some very obvious behaviors and attitudes that would make that actual endeavor, being an air cadet, impossible. And at the age of 18, he was hospitalized and subsequently he was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder and anxiety. He had a very hard time accepting his illness. Well, actually, I haven't talked about it much on this podcast. I talk about it in my work. People do have trouble accepting, not everyone, but many people find it difficult to accept a mental health diagnosis. And rightly so. You should always, even physical health diagnosis, you should do your own research and see what feels right for you. But professionals can get it wrong sometimes, and sometimes they don't. But he had a hard time accepting that illness and diagnosis that, you know, caused him a lot of suffering and for more than 12 years, really. And at that point, he found the support and he felt, and this is really, really important, he actually felt the desire to get better um, and he sought the help he needed. And that's key because sometimes with mental illness, it's all consuming. And unfortunately, people are unable sometimes to seek help because they don't feel they need help. And, it, you know, we see it. We see it with a lot of people in the press. And you may even have family members or, or work colleagues or friends of family who have diagnoses. But very difficult for them to accept that something could be wrong. And so they never seek help. And, you know, at that point, Leaf did find the help. Um, and also he started writing books. And through the help, he did consequently and subsequently get better. And he was able to return to work. And then he traveled a lot. So this, to me, is a story of somebody who struggled eventually sought the help, accepted his diagnosis, and we talk about how it was treated as well, including medication, because I know a lot of people talk about medication not being the best thing. And that's, uh, for me, that's an uninformed and quite an ignorant attitude. If you're not a medical professional, if you're not a medical doctor, then you wouldn't know about medication. You can read up on it, but you have to have case studies. You have to have worked with people and you have to have professional education to know a bit more about the complexities of what happens to your body when you ingest a medication or any drug. 
And it's uninformed to say, oh, uh, medication doesn't help. I do rem I recall once somebody approached me for uh, supervision and for counseling. Uh, and they're holistic therapists, but they believe that, well, medication, these people should stop taking medication and they should just uh, do some meditation or uh, to, would change their diet. And, you know, sometimes people will approach the podcast to be on the show. And I have had to turn people down because of those views. It's uneducation, uneducated and uninformed. And also, you know, even when I trained years ago, in hypnotherapy, doing my counseling, all of that counseling degree, I did come across, especially on the holistic front, when I was training to do holistic therapies, that some people would get these qualifications and then start calling themselves doctors, which is just um, unethical, I'm afraid. It's unethical. And you don't see it as much anymore because of the internet. But when I started out, people were doing that. And then, or they might become an acupuncturist and call themselves a doctor and wear white coats and things like that. So massage therapists usually wear white coats. White coats are fine. That's okay. But to portray yourself as a medical professional is unethical and it gives the public the wrong information. It's false advertising. But one person did say that they, you know, people should stop taking medication and just change their diet, which is just... You, okay, some of that could be, there could be a combination, but it, it's clear a statement like that means you have no education on uh, neuropsychology, psychology, or how, or science, or how uh, medications can affect your chemistry and how they work on the prefrontal cortex, all of that. It's something that if you haven't any education about it, then you should probably be saying instead, I think, or I believe, and not, no, this is what people should do. I work in mental health, and I have worked in hospitals, and I know that medication can definitely help people to control their anxiety, monitor psychiatric illness, uh, in the UK, there is the Mental Health Act, there's the Mental Capacity Act, they're two very separate things. When someone loses the capacity to make decisions and they are sectioned under the Mental Health Act, that's in the UK, then they are under our community mental health team, psychiatrists, a whole team of people usually uh, to help them and to monitor their symptoms and to suggest, uh, prescribe medications and other things that may help. But, you know, a, a holistic therapist cannot do that. They can't give a diagnosis. An acupuncturist should not be telling people uh, that, that they should come off their medication. So always, uh, you know, my view is always be aware of that. If you want acupuncture, great, or any other hypnotherapy, whatever it may be, reflexology, holistic healing, all of that stuff is wonderful. As you all know, I'm a proponent of it. I do healing myself. So... I do give people healing, that kind of thing. And I am a holistic therapist. But I also work in mental health. And I know, uh, I've been a practitioner. I know the symptoms. I certainly know how to look for them, to spot them. And that can be a good thing, mostly. Um, but sometimes people do reject what is apparent. And even as a professional, I wouldn't go to someone who's, you know, I'm not their doctor. I'm not their, I'm not a doctor and I'm not their doctor is what I'm saying. I'm not going to go to someone and say, look, I think you have this or I think you have that. I mean, you know, so we have to be respectful of people. But if they're causing, because it does happen. So let's say you have a family member and something's happening with them and you know something's wrong. The best thing you can do is support them, give them information, and perhaps try and persuade and support them to go to see a professional. In the UK, the first port of call would be your GP, and therefore a referral to a psychiatrist can be made. If it's severe, then of course it's 111. You must go to hospital. You must go to A&E. 
There are protocols, and I'm speaking about the UK only because that's where I am, that's where I live, it's my home. And I wonder, in other parts of the country, you know, or the world, shall we say, not the country, other parts of the world, certainly it may be, it may be very different. Um, but our NHS system has a, a system in place for people now do we need more help more funding absolutely and that's on the agenda we're not going to talk well anyway <laughs> there's lots happening in the uk but yes it's we do need more funding we need more help over the past few years mental health services in the uk have been cut and dwindled down trying to get help for you know, child services cams. If you're in the UK, you'll know it's very difficult. Um, huge waiting lists. People do struggle, uh, but there are private therapists as well. So if you have to go the private route, then you may have to go the private route. If you have uh, personal insurance, you don't have to rely on the NHS. Then by all means, do your research and look uh, for alternatives if it's severe. But if not. A&E has to be the first protocol. And I'm saying all this because Leaf realized that he did need help, that his behavior was not conducive to a healthy life, and his thoughts weren't conducive to a healthy life. They were dissociated. They weren't real. And he's going to tell you some bits about, some. he's going to give you some examples of that. And this is why I am so, so grateful to Leaf for agreeing to come on the show to talk to you all about what he's been through, what his particular journey was like, and how he has survived it and is thriving today, doing his own thing, writing. He has a very active, very popular blog out, and all the, the of course, as always, the links will be in the show notes, he's got his website, edmontonwriter.com. Go there, you can see his blog, and you can download a PDF of some of his books, which we're going to get into. They are fascinating. And he actually wrote a book whilst he was hospitalized. And, you know, he wrote a journey. I mean, that it's just incredible, the work that Leaf has done. And his book, that particular book, and all of his books are great, but this one is spectacular. And so join me in welcoming Leif Gregerson to the show. Leif, it's really nice to see you. Thank you so much for joining me today. You're quite welcome. I'm, it's a pleasure to uh, connect with you across the ocean. Yes, it is across the ocean. So Leif, You've got a very interesting story, and it's one of the reasons why I wanted to speak with you and have you on the podcast today. I ask all my guests to send a little bit of a bio through, and I was intrigued. One of the, well, two words that you used when you were talking about your early life, you said early on you kind of felt like you had a few quirks and personality flaws. Mm -hmm. I just wondered what sort of led you to that observation well i was i was very shy um and i didn't realize it until much later but i had anxiety uh fortunately they never developed into panic attacks but but the anxiety would be probably i, I guess the best way to describe it would be just a rush of adrenaline and then you know having shaky hands and feeling nervous and and things like that and uh sort of overstimulated i guess and uh yeah i i was in the hospital at a young age i was 14 when i first went went to a hospital for a psychiatric reason and uh that sort of prompted me to be more vigilant i guess yeah. about uh, about any problems i i was having yes well that is quite young and, you know, as we know, some children, even younger, do experience uh, some of those symptoms as well. But mm -hmm. you were saying that that was your first sort of entry into uh, being sectioned from the mental health ward? Um, I, sectioned, I guess that's when, you, when you're involuntary, involuntarily committed. Um, when I was 14, I wasn't involuntarily committed. Um, 
basically I had a talk with my mom psychiatrist and he just wanted me in for some observation I see. and I was there for a week and then we had a family meeting which didn't go well so he kept me for another week and it was hard not to see it as punishment because I really didn't like being there I didn't like being away from my family um but uh but there were certain things I learned from it Yeah, no, absolutely. And what would you say was one of the biggest sort of observations that you would have learned or lessons or anything that you would have learned from Well, it? I, I did lack the awareness that I really had any kind of a psychiatric problem. Um, it, it wasn't really dream drilled home to me that, yes, you have sort of a, a different chemical makeup or whatever. Uh, that, that wasn't made apparent. Um, so what happened was I, I got out of the hospital. I was prescribed medication and I didn't take it. Um, but I did realize there were things going wrong. And I did also realize that I didn't like being in the hospital. So I started trying to do more normal things. Um, before I was sent to the hospital at age 14, uh, I was a bit rambunctious. I was, uh, I, I was involved in air cadets, which was something I really, really enjoyed. And I maybe took too seriously. And uh, I, I, in, I became so uh, gung-ho about air cadets that I would wear camouflage clothing to school and things like that and carry jack and uh so i i basically when i left the hospital i figured if i stopped carrying jack and making fires and uh and wearing combat combat uniforms to school that uh things would get better um so i went out and got more normal clothes and all that sort of stuff but what what was unfortunate was that uh um later on i started experiencing severe depressions and they were really bad and i wasn't aware of a way to get any help for them and um i would also experience certain manic episodes and and those would most often come along if i had a few drinks um but the thing was uh as as a young kid who was very nervous and experienced anxiety um if there was a dance or something i could go to I I would go there and just sit in the corner and do nothing and talk to my friends and and uh refuse to dance even if some some girl begged me. Um but if I had a few drinks, I I would relax, I would have fun, I would ask girls to dance, it would it would be a party, be a memorable time. Uh but really when I look back it was more that I was sort of tipped over into the manic side. Um so my full diagnosis at present um is schizoaffective disorder with anxiety which is a combination of schizophrenia bipolar and anxiety yes okay thank you so much for explaining that because a schizoaffective disorder can be mixed and it is often a combination of manic and depressive states um and yours as you've explained is mixed in with anxiety as well which can be a whole different uh you know challenge in in itself really hmm Definitely, yeah. absolutely so Yes. So I, and the way you have just explained that as well is really helpful, because as you were saying, with the alcohol involved, it released your inhibitions. However, it kind of led you on to the manic side a bit more. Yeah. So that's quite interesting. But I think Mm. it's only indicative of how different everyone can be. their chemical makeup. Yeah. Mm. So for you, the <clears throat> advancement of different medications, because thank goodness they're still researching, they're still looking into things, they're still trying to help advance these medications. What might you say to someone who, who perhaps um, is not feeling themselves, A lot of people are afraid of medication. Why do you think that is? Um, well, one of the things about psychiatric medication that makes it different from other stuff is that uh, it, it's something you're most likely going to take permanently, um, which can be very difficult to, to accept. 
Uh, for example, especially if if you say you go to see a psychiatrist, they prescribe an antidepressant, and it makes you feel worse. Um, it, it's very hard to think, okay, well, this makes me feel worse, but I'm supposed to take it for the rest of my life. Now, there's there's a couple of factors to that to consider first, and and that's uh, the, the factor that uh, psychiatric medication takes a while for you to adjust to. And it takes a while to work properly, so you have to give it time. Um, but sometimes, even even after that time and that adjustment process, um, it's still not the right medication for you. Um, so someone who was uh, someone who was reluctant to take medications, um, I guess what I would say to them would be just you know, uh, take takes take the time it's it's going to take to to find out if that medication will work for you. And once you've given it six weeks, two months, um, you know, um, once you've given it the proper amount of time, don't be afraid to go back to your psychiatrist and say, this is not working. I need something else. You know, there's so many medications out there and they react differently to people. And, and this is something also um, I, I, I used to work in a psychiatric hospital as a creative writing teacher. And one of the first things I would teach people about would be keeping a journal. And keeping a journal is something excellent, especially if you're starting off uh, with uh, medications, because then you can write down and, and track your progress as to like what my mom first started keeping a journal before I did. Uh, she, she had psychiatric problems as well. Uh, and what she would do is she would write the date and then she'd write a number from one to 10 of her mood. And then she would basically just just write, and um, it's a helpful tool in in realizing you know what's working, what's not working, um, what I should be doing, what I should not be doing, that sort of thing. Especially if you go back, you know, after some time and and look at what you've written. Yeah, such a good point, a brilliant point that you've got to be aware of what's happening to you and how the medicine's affecting you. You're introducing something foreign into your system that's meant to help you. And as you've said, sometimes it can you can feel worse. So giving it time to work as such uh, is important, but also, as you've said, keeping a diary, keeping a journal, keeping track of how you're feeling, what's happening for you, um, the dose that you're taking, and then again, further going back to your doctor to say, this is not working or this is working is so yeah. important. And, and there is something, oh, sorry. Um, there is something that I, I just wanted to add to that. Um, therapy can be very effective, like a psychotherapy. Uh, generally, psychiatrists don't, don't do it anymore. I'm not sure how it's handled in the UK, but you, you basically, you go to see a psychologist or, or a, CBT counselor or something like that. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, can be very effective at helping uh, with things like uh, schizoaffective disorder, you know, symptoms of schizophrenia. It can help with symptoms of bipolar. Um, the most help I got from taking a CBT course uh, was to get a handle on my anxiety. And um, But there are other therapies for people with other classes of problems and um yeah it's just uh you go to see a psychiatrist for medication but really that's just half the story the whole story is you should get therapy as well and uh and it can be very effective sometimes yeah. even um psychotherapy can be more effective than medication alone sometimes but that doesn't mean you should just take one or the other you should combine them for the best effects. Yes, throw everything at it, absolutely. And as you say, sometimes the combination can work and then it might change. It could go up and down. But yes, yeah. CBT is helpful because it challenges your thoughts, what what you're thinking, which can often lead to the behavior, or lead to the behavior, actually, what you might <laughs> do. Um, okay, that's really helpful. And also, I know that you are an advocate for mental health awareness. So mm -hmm. if someone, you know, is thinking, right, I, I, this has gone on for years now, I really need to do something about this now. It's affecting my work, it's affecting my family, it's affecting, or whatever it is. 
Mm -hmm. Um, What would you say to to people about being aware, mental health aware? Um, Well, it can be very difficult. Um, I, I would, I would suggest, you know, uh, a, a lot of a lot of people can start uh, by going to a library and taking out some of the number of wonderful books that have been written about mental illness. Um, that's a bit of a difficult route, you know, because you have to invest so much time into reading a book. There are audio books. Uh, um, one audio book I, uh, I found helpful to the point of wanting to recommend was called The Collected Schizophrenias. And uh, I think it by Esme... Uh, Wei Jung Wang or something like that um, but uh, yeah find out about that and and also talk to your talk to your family doctor uh, again I'm not certain how, how everything works in the UK um, but you talk to your family doctor and, and usually they're able to get you a referral to a psychiatrist in Canada I do know once you talk to your family doctor and, and then get a referral to a psychiatrist you could be on a waiting list for up to six months, which is really unfortunate. Um, something I suggest is uh, to find a friend. And, and of course, it's always good to make friends with someone who who has mental health difficulties. They, they can really use all the friends they can get. Uh, but find a friend who's being treated by a psychiatrist and um, just go with them to their appointment and, and possibly, uh, you know, just get them to ask the psychiatrist, can you see my friend for a few minutes? He's kind of struggling. He doesn't know what's going on or she doesn't know what's going on. And um, this is something I did with my brother. Uh, he was suffering quite severely and um, he, he didn't know how to get help or what to do. And uh, the idea of waiting for six months to get seen by a psychiatrist was just, just about out of the question. Uh, so I just had him sort of take my appointment and that was that's always been what i can see as the fastest way to get help that's incredible it's the same here waiting lists maybe even worse in canada oh. uh, oh. but yes you're right go to your gp your general practitioner talk about and and you talk about what you're experiencing and you will be referred to a psych a psych a psychiatrist or somebody, a psychologist, perhaps somebody who can yeah. help. It it absolutely can't hurt to uh, approach a, a psychologist. Um, once one counselor slash psychologist I went to see was actually uh, a chaplain at a hospital where my mom had passed away, and uh, she was very helpful, and and she wasn't really part of the whole system. I didn't have to wait this year. Uh, she wasn't paid for by uh, what what we have for insurance for health insurance, where I live is called Alberta Healthcare. Uh, she didn't bill Alberta Healthcare; she just charged me directly. Uh, but she worked on a sliding scale, and and we found a an amount that I could reasonably handle, um, and uh, so I was able to get in right away again for that. Um, so it might be helpful to put your name in to see somebody, and then to try and reach out to a private. A psychologist or, or counselor and uh, get get some help immediately while you're in that in-between point the yeah. toilet I guess you could call it yes absolutely and unfortunately you know in the UK at least mental health services have been reduced over the years which is a real shame and so you do have to reach out but yeah do what you can uh, because I would say it's worse to be suffering with no help and no support than yeah. to at least reach out. Absolutely. Now yeah. you've got three. And, and your family doctor. Oh, sorry, yes. I just want to. Ahead. Your family doctor can prescribe uh, certain medications to help. Uh, they're certainly qualified to uh, to prescribe mild antidepressants and things like that. Um, but usually. Anything more serious, you might have to be admitted to a hospital. Absolutely. And I'm so glad you've said that because things can get very serious, um, you know, very, very serious and very quickly for people. So you do, you know, if you if you are admitted, and that's the other point I would say, and I wanted to get your take on that. A lot of people think it's the end of the world for them if they're admitted. 
they feel that it's on their record and oh my goodness, that's the end. But actually, it could be a lifesaver. Yeah. What well, I, I remember having having a horrible time in the hospital, all these awful things happening, being locked up with people that scared me and, and disturbed me and things like that. Um, but the thing is, when you're in the hospital, you're never going to have a really good impression of it because you're ill. Um, when I look back and, and I consider that I was 18, I was very messed up. I was deep in psychosis. I was believing some very bizarre things and acting on these bizarre ideas. And uh, in, in a few matter of a couple of months, uh, without me even sharing what was going on in my head, um, in a couple of months, the hospital brought me back to sanity and um and i was able to return to uh to living where i was before and, and stuff like that and go back to working and everything um now the big problem was once i was released from the hospital uh i had something i call the, the aspirin effect quite often people have a headache they take an aspirin the headache goes away they're, they're not going to keep taking aspirin um, but that's not the way psychiatric medications work. You, you take them and you keep taking them and you, you try to keep them at a therapeutic dose and all that. And uh, this is something I didn't do. And I had struggles for quite a while. Yes. I'm so glad you mentioned that. We we do see this happen where people think, oh, I'm fine now. You see, I'm back at work. I'm doing, I'm okay. I, I don't need to take it anymore. But as you've explained, that's really not how psychiatric medication works. No. And you do have to continue. And that can be a detriment. A lot of people feel, oh, no, that's a sentence as such. Um, yeah. yeah. But then well, there are cases where there are cases where you can go off your medications. But I strongly suggest that you don't make that decision on your own. Um, make it with your spouse. Make it with uh, your psychiatrist. Make it. You know, make sure they understand what you're going through and why you want to lower your dose, and 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 uh, they can explain to you how to safely do it. Uh, I had a situation. I was taking a mood stabilizer called Depakine, and I was taking these large pills, four of them a day, and uh, I lowered it to two pills a day because I thought it was sedating me too much, and I thought, okay, well. You know, it's still going to work. My, I, I'm not that serious anymore. I'll just take it, you know, and, and if I have problems, I'll go back on the old dose. Um, the problem was this, this Depakine that I was taking has, has to have a therapeutic level in your blood. And when I lowered the dose, it went out of that range and became completely ineffective. And so it didn't take long until I, uh, I ended up being in psychosis and having to go back to the hospital. Yeah. Um, yes, again, very important point. And j just to quickly add, because our viewers, our listeners will know my background, having worked um, within mental health. Mm. And, uh, you know, I'm also an alternative therapist, so I do like and push alternative therapies. But what does bother me is when people with holistic experience and holistic therapies begin to speak as if they're medical doctors. And they oh. start to tell people, well, if you know, they wouldn't need psychiatric medicine if they had acupuncture or if they did this or that. Uh, so dangerous, misleading. Mm -hmm. And I have had holistic therapists on the podcast, but... I'm always very straightforward in saying you're not a medical doctor and then yeah. people should take advice. So as you said, people should take advice. If you're going to lower your dose, get a, a consultation with your doctor first. Yeah. So you've got three mental health memoirs as well. Yeah. Tell, tell us about that because you've been writing for a while, haven't you? You, you wrote. Well, you know, it's funny because, uh, um, I actually started writing before I could even properly write words. Uh, my parents would often buy me blank pa blank pads of paper, and I just loved them. And I would draw spaceships and write stories and stuff going pew, pew, and, you know, I got you, you got me. And 
sometimes I read cowboy stories. So, so it actually started quite at a young age. Um, as far as my, my mental health books, um, so uh, the three mental health books, um, this one is called Through the Withering Storm. And it is available on Amazon UK, I believe, in ebook and uh, paperback format. Excellent. I'll um, put a link. I'll put a link to these books in the show notes, great. viewers. So. Okay. Um, yeah. So this this first book, um, it it starts out when I was uh, just a young kid before I was leaving for my air cadet basic training, and sort of being a, a small kid in a large world. And uh, going off, I, it was the first time I was away from home without my family. And uh, it, it cover, the, the book covers my teen years and some of the things that happened. I try to keep a light mood and, and talk about, you know, um, I used to love pranks and things like that and jokes I would do. You know, we, we had this stupid thing we would do where when we got to a, a table, we would unscrew the salt shaker and just rest it on top. So when somebody went to put salt in their food, they got a whole container of salt. And uh, it, it was a very bad joke to play on people. But uh, but I put a lot of things like that, fun fun times. and uh, But I also talk about uh, the struggles of trying to fit in in, in the stressful environment of a high school uh, while I had things going on in my head that were that were just not healthy. So that's through the withering storm, and then uh, that the through the withering storm carries on into my early days as an adult, where I went to the coast. Uh, I did a lot of different things. I tried to join the military unsuccessfully. Um, I tried to go through commercial pilot school for a while, uh, which I absolutely loved, but uh, simply was not for me. It should not. I should not have been medically uh, allowed to do that. Uh, I, I never soloed or anything. There was no danger. Um, but I just never would have been able to pass the, the strict medical for a, to become a pilot. Um, so that all sort of came to, came to an end. And I accepted my illness and accepted that I needed help. And then that's where this book comes in. And uh, it's called uh, I'm Inching, Inching Back to Sane, A Memoir of a Mental Illness. And... Uh, there's actually two versions of this, but I don't recommend people buy the other version. Um, it's a purple cover with a picture of a, a statue. Um, just keep an eye out for the butterfly if you'd like to get it. And that's the second edition. It's a much better one. Um, the other book um, I wrote, the, the third one, uh, this is another memoir, uh, but it's it's very different from just about any book out there. Uh what I started out with was I got my my dad, who's now departed, uh, to write the introduction for it, and uh, he he wrote a very heart wrenching story about me, and uh, about the pride he had in seeing me overcome my illness. Uh, then I had my sister, a friend. Um, I put some glossaries of terms so people can understand when I'm talking about different things about psychiatry. Uh, one of the things that's unique, make it very unique, is uh, I took some po poetry that I had written by hand in the hospital, and I scanned it into the book, and then I wrote commentary about it. And then the big thing that uh, a lot of people want to get the book for is uh, the other thing I did was I scanned in my clinical notes from my from the clinic I went to and from the hospital, from both doctors and nurses. Um, so I think it gives a really excellent idea for people of what it's like to be hospitalized. Um, the, the other two books uh, are sort of linear and they take place in my recovery and in my teen years. Uh, this one is more simply about one hospitalization. Mm -hmm. And it's not really a story as, as it's more of just a snapshot of, uh, well, that it's in the title, Alert and Oriented Times 3, which is a nursing term. They, mm -hmm. they say. Yes. Yes. Oh, in the UK as well. Yeah. Um, and then the subtitle is a snapshot of a severe psychosis. And uh, yeah. yeah, I've actually written 12 books, uh, but those are the ones I focus on. Interesting. I really like the title of your books. And that one, 
uh, alert and oriented. Um, yes. So we, we do use those terms um, mm. or disoriented. And oh. I, I'm really drawn to inching back. I That whole, just those words, inching back, you know, just bit yep. by bit is just such a. Yeah. One of the neat things is, is I, uh, when I put the cover on it, I put uh, sort of caterpillars in different stages and then coming out sane <laughs> or uh, butterflies. Inching back to say, I mean, it, it's, it's powerful actually. Oh, thank you. But also the concept of your, of the third book as well, alert and oriented times three with your clinical notes. I mean, you know, that is so brave. It's exposing a part of you but also in doing so, you, you'll be helping so many people to break down what I want to ask you about next, and that's stigmatization. Oh, yeah. Mental health and mental illness is stigmatized. What uh -huh. are your thoughts on that? Why do you think people stigmatize it? Well, you know, it's funny because I grew up with, with my mother having a mental illness, and... Um, I still have a lot of uh, really, really, uh, I can't even think of a fair word for it, but really bad ideas of, of, of people with mental illness. And um, I, you know, coming coming out of being a high school student and being, you know, subject to all those teenage, uh, teenage problems and judgments and things like that, uh, I went directly from high school to the hospital. I was taken there. I was quite ill. Um, I stigmatize people with mental illness. I, I felt they were, you know, uh, a lesser people because they had problems, which was horrible. Uh, but as I got older, I started seeing that some of these people um, were actually really wonderful people underneath, underneath their problems. And, um, yeah, it one of the things uh, I, I do, I do uh, presentations for the Schizophrenia Society. And one of the things that just pops up whenever I think about stigma is uh, it, it's estimated that, well, first of all, it's estimated that 1% of the population will have schizophrenia. So that's a huge number, especially if you look at it globally or nationally. But the thing is, 10% of those people at some point will die. And um, this is because they're uh, they're isolated, because their family has given up on on them, um, and and it's really horrible. Uh, something I've seen again and again in in the years I've I've given these presentations and met people and gone to support groups. The thing I see again and again is, if a person has uh, a caregiver regardless if that caregiver is their 70 year old father or mother who are just doing the best they can um they have so much of a better chance at recovery and um you know it just uh it kind of reminds me i had a friend um I, I i met him for lunch one time and he brought his daughter and she was very quiet and and didn't say anything and uh he says you should see her at home she we can't shut her up and um that's an example of what it's like to be in a family in there and uh and and to not feel you know stigmatized for talking too much or whatever but now i've been in the hospital a number of times the last time i had a serious admission and and actually the one the hospitalization for alert and oriented times 3 was due to a medication change that didn't work very well for me and I don't really want to name the medication or anything like that or, or or blame the psychiatrist. But the thing was, when I was in the hospital, uh, at the end of the book, Inching Back to Sane, the difference that happened was that when I was discharged, I wasn't sent out to live on my own where I would isolate. Likely down the road, I might go off my medications, get sick again, have problems. Heaven knows what could have happened. But what happened when I was released from that hospital visit, I was I was sent to a group home. And in the group home, there were other male adults who had psychiatric problems. And it was so completely different for me because all of a sudden, 
there was no stigma because everybody either understood what it's like to have a mental illness or they were trained to help people who had mental illnesses. And um, it was a time of, of very uh, serious growth for me and, and maturing. And uh, this was the time when I, when I sat down and took the serious uh, approach to writing my book and, and getting it out there. And uh, yeah, so not all group homes are, are perfect. Some of them aren't even very good, but, but the one I got sent to made a difference because it was like having a family. It was like, you know, um, I, there, was, there was no isolation. There was no loneliness. And uh, yeah, I ended up staying there, I think, about 15 years, actually. Uh, and then it just got to the point where, you know, it was just obvious I was well enough to live on my own. And I'm, I'm very happy to do so now. That is excellent. And it gives a good picture of what could happen. Some people have said they form lifelong friendships in some homes. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it's there. It's a therapeutic space, isn't it? It's meant to be therapeutic. Yeah. Well, you know, I always I always say the big thing is all of a sudden I was getting regular meals, regular sleep, regular medication, people to talk to. Um, they would keep an eye on my appointments. If if I missed an appointment, they would know about it and they'd, they'd get after me on it. And, uh, yeah, so it was just, uh, it, it benefited me in many ways. Yes, you were being looked after, really, mm -hmm. which is good. And that's what it's there for, to people to look after you when you're unable, do no fault of your own, to look after yourself. Yeah. And that's a good way to describe it. So I was going to ask you about that, to, to maybe to give our listeners a bit of a view about your daily life when you are in hospital. Mm. Um, because a lot of people say they can't remember a lot of it when I ask. They, yeah. they can't remember a lot of it. And that's obviously for many reasons. But yeah. What would be an overview of maybe a, a day? Well, you know, there's a day I think back to, and, and there were many like this, uh, but there's a day I look back to when I wasn't getting the proper medication I needed, and I was very deep in psychosis, which included delusions and hallucinations. And um, I remember I, I got up early. I think the time for the nursing station to start handing out cigarettes was 6 a.m. or something. Uh, fortunately, I've quit since then, quit smoking since then, but at the time I was quite dependent on on nicotine um so i got up like before six and i went in the, the tv room to wait for the nursing station to open and the news was on the tv and uh i i could literally look at that news and i could hear and see them talking about me and saying things bizarre things strange things and and telling the public how to react to me doing this or doing that or just really odd things. Um, six o'clock rolled around. I went and got a cigarette. Uh, I smoked it very quickly and I felt a little better. And then I went back for another one, had it. Um, after about the third cigarette, I, I would feel the effects of the nicotine sort of as a buzz in my body because I hadn't had one all night. But I also sort of had the mental state uh I also had a better mental state and I, all of a sudden I wasn't hallucinating as, as badly. And I was, you know, I could tell the TV was just a, just a news program. Um, now the funny thing is, is uh, nicotine can sometimes help a person in some cases, and it can, can sometimes badly harm a person's situation. Uh, one thing that's interesting about nicotine is it's supposed to affect some of the same neurotransmitters that, uh, uh, psychiatric meds do and I'll never forget uh, going to an emergency room once and asking you know do you mind if I have a cigarette and the doctor said oh go ahead have two and the nurse was trying to talk me out of going anywhere but the doctor was like you know uh, what what harm is it going to do and um, and it it actually benefited because it helped helped me stabilize and relax um, but the problem with nicotine is or cigarettes in general, is with some medications. Uh, certainly, clozapine is one of them, and clozapine is 
a huge medication right now. Um, smoking, if, if you're a smoker, uh, you have to take a higher dose. And smoking can actually make the, the medication less effective. But uh, So I, I don't endorse smoking, but I certainly do endorse uh, people being aware that their breathing can affect their, their mental state. And um, instead of uh, instead of smoking a cigarette, consider getting some some relaxation training that you can do on your own. You know, like uh, the, there's different things. I was looking at one meditation thing where you breathe in slowly to a count of four in, in your nose, breathe out slowly to a count of eight with your mouth, and then um, just sort of become aware of different parts of your body and relax them. And uh, that can probably be just as effective as a cigarette. Wow, that's so interesting. Uh, and yes, a lot of people do use nicotine and other substances, unfortunately, to mm. uh, self-medicate. Um, yeah. But as you're saying, with nicotine, it actually can be a helpful thing. And when you're unwell, you want to use what you can that will yeah. have the least negative effect. Um, so that was very poignant, though, that image of watching that TV news program and then just being, I suppose, disoriented in, in time and space. Thinking yeah. That, yeah, it was about you and it wasn't. But very quickly, that after the cigarette, that changed. Um, mm. And, you know, I suppose, Leaf, when we look at things like paranoia um, and people often, you know, associate that with conspiracy theories, I, I think there's a lot of paranoia in conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. That's quite different from schizophrenia. Um, and, and I wonder if maybe you could tell us why. Why would that be different? Um, well, uh, as far as paranoia goes, it's really only common sense that everyone's out to get you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's just a joke. Um, <laughs> paranoia is, can be a, a big part of schizophrenia. And something I've noticed is that um, some, of the, some of the things people are paranoid about are similar across a section of people. You know, things like uh, very common is, is that the CIA put a, a tracking device in my tooth. Uh, very common is someone put a computer chip in my brain either to read my thoughts or to track me. Um, I, I've seen so many repetitions of the same theme um, of, of people having paranoid cons conspiracy theories and things like that. But um, something I, I like to all, always stress is for someone to understand, um, not just for themselves, but probably for their family members and for care caregivers too, uh, there was a movie uh, directed by a former member of Monty Python um, called uh, 12 Monkeys. And it had Bruce Willis and Brad Pitt in it. You've seen it? Oh, yes. It was a science fiction. This was a science fiction exploration of schizophrenia. Without a doubt, this, this director, the person who wrote it, they were very aware of what mental illness is like. And and I saw things like how uh, Bruce Willis was traveling through time, and he actually did rip out one of his teeth. And um, there were there were scenes. Uh, what what I found really amazing was Bruce Willis was sort of a fictional character that was going through some of the things that people with schizophrenia do, but Brad Pitt actually played a person who had schizophrenia. And um, he, he did such a brilliant job. They showed him in, in the state hospital and they showed him later leading their revolt of the 12 monkeys. And I don't want to reveal too much about it, but uh, he, he was just brilliant. And um, there was one scene where uh, they said, well, how did they know you were going to do this? And he said, well, maybe they've, maybe they've programmed a computer with all my thoughts and all my ideas and and they made it so that they can figure out what my next move is, and and this again is a very common delusion, and um, yeah, so it, I do think paranoia is a part of, 
can be a part of schizophrenia. And um, there's certain there's I'm sure there's an, a whole subset of people with schizophrenia who have paranoia. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't feel it's something different or separate. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have paranoia without having schizophrenia, though. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's something that that just once again makes it so difficult to try and treat the illness. It does. And that is the thing with psychiatric illnesses. Um, you know, there's no one fits all. And I know we have all of our the DSM-5, we have the ICD-10, we have all these medical journals with all these diagnoses um, and it changes. And But it's very difficult sometimes to fit people in those categories and boxes. Mm -hmm. Can look different for, on everyone. That was a brilliant movie, Twelve Months. Oh ago. yeah, it was absolutely brilliant, and they were all excellent in it. Um, yeah. When we also talk about stigma, one of the things you've said is that you know sometimes people can feel that they're not a normal person, or, or mm -hmm. that other people can think, well, people with mental illness aren't normal, and actually everyone is normal it is a part of you it's a part of what's happening for you now people have other quirks mm -hmm. so mental illness is one thing it's try it's how i try and explain to people but what would you say to people who feel that they're not maybe considered a regular person and within that stigmatization uh well you know I always try to look on the positive side of things. I, I joke around with people and I say, well, if somebody told me I was going to die on Sunday, I'd have to let it cheer because that would mean that I didn't have to do my laundry that Saturday. I really believe there's a positive side to everything. Um, if a person um, is... is I'd, I, I don't know if the, the term divergent is a good one because that implies that you're different than, than the, the normal normal population. But uh, um, one of the things is if, if you have uh, a serious disability like schizophrenia, there are some positive aspects to it. And, and one of them is uh, sometimes you can't work. A lot of times people with schizophrenia can't work. And um, there's a number of retraining programs and there's supports and there's different things um, to get you to a job that you can't handle, which is, you know, something that not everybody has access to. I know when I was younger, I, I was offered um, different scholarships and things because of my disabilities. Uh, I, I ended up taking other courses instead of the ones that, that cost a lot of money. Uh, but I've really enjoyed... I really enjoy sort of, I tell people that I'm semi-retired. Uh, I, of course, I continue to write. I continue to work for the Schizophrenia Society. You know, I, I probably put in full-time hours, but I get to choose what I want to do. And, and having the support that I do, I'm able to work a job that doesn't pay a whole lot like the Schizophrenia Society, but it has a lot of advantages. And um, so for people who for people who feel not normal um you use your differences as an advantage i mean you have this unique thing if you if you have schizophrenia and you've been through medications and hospitalizations then you have the unique ability to understand others who are going through these things and um you know another thing is uh with my schedule with my being able to make my own schedule I can allow for those times when I'm just not going to be able to get out of bed. And, and, you know, I try to, I try to schedule a couple of days a week uh, to have a long sleep. Um, and uh, it can be very enjoyable just to sleep in and not worry about anything and to know you're going to, you're still going to pay your rent and, and all that sort of stuff. So I, I would just say, you know, for people who, who uh, see themselves as not normal, um, consider consider calling themselves advantaged. Yes, that's a that's a really good way to look at. I yes, and for younger people, you know, in my early days doing internships, sometimes I did work with younger people who were diagnosed, and I would say, look, you've got this superpower. 
you know, <laughs> your dream. Sometimes with schizophrenia, people have talked about their dreams or schizoaffective disorder, that their dreams tend to be quite vivid. And I don't mm -hmm. know if you've experienced that. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, the funny thing of the funny thing about dreams is sometimes when I give my presentations, I, I tell the audience that uh, most of you have been have experienced psychosis. Only you don't realize it. You you experience it having a dream because you've got this false sensory input that's very convincing, that is not real, that can end up terrifying, that can end up, you know, and um that's sort of a taste of what psychosis can be like, especially well, I don't know if everyone uh with psychosis has negative experiences. I'm sure some there are some people who have positive ones. But most of the people I know who go through psychosis are have negative things. Somebody's following them. Somebody wants to harm them, things like that. And when you have a nightmare, in, when a normal person or a, non, a, pers a, non, uh, a person who does not have schizophrenia, when they have a nightmare, then they experience what a person who has schizophrenia goes through. Oh, such a good analogy. People wake up sweating, frightened. Uh, yeah, yep. yeah, absolutely. That's a brilliant and, analogy. And I definitely have vivid dreams. Um, it's funny. I used to. Uh, I used to have a lot of dreams that would recur, and they would come in a series, mm -hmm. and there'd be a number of them. And it's sort of like watching TV. I like. I'll turn on the TV and see what shows I want to catch up on. And um, that's what my dream was like. I had like six or seven dreams that were just serials and continuations of, of previous ones. And yeah. Um, the thing I learned about dreaming was uh, there is a way to begin to start to control your dreaming, uh, which is very simple. All you have to do is uh, about five or six times a day, you need to be able to remind yourself to do this. Just stop and take a look around and consciously ask yourself, am I dreaming right now? And that's all you have to do. And after a while, you start to automatically ask yourself that question and you automatically become aware, am I dreaming? Am I not dreaming? I'm not dreaming. Um, and then funny enough, when, when, you, when you're used to this question, you have a dream and you're asking yourself, am I dreaming? Am I not dreaming? I am dreaming. And then you'd be able, then with that awareness, you become able to control some of the outcomes of your dreams. It, it's actually, it's actually a pretty interesting process. That is very interesting. But Leif, how did you learn to be so self caring? Because you, you have, you appear to have a very good uh, grasp and knowledge about how to care for yourself. Um, well, I think I think it had a lot to do with my dad. Uh, my mom was a very caring person and very kind, very intelligent. She used to read a lot and spend a lot of time with us talking one on one about things. And uh, TV wasn't uh, well. For there were times when TV sort of took over our lives, especially when we got our first movie play. I remember we would, we would have to watch three, four movies a night practically. Uh, but. Uh, like, for example, when when I was a young kid, my dad uh, would get the family all in the living room and he would read books like William Faulkner or or uh, Daniel Defoe, Robinson Crusoe, whatever. And um, it just reading and learning and uh, and all that was just such a big part of me growing up. And my mom would talk to me a lot about she She was aware of her illness. Uh, she didn't have an illness like mine, but I think. I think probably her the best description of her illness could have been depression with psychosis. And um, she taught me a lot about taking care of my mind and things like that. Um, but the funny thing about my dad was uh, he was from Europe and he had served in the military and he was just such a neat person. Like, I mean, neat as a, as a cool, whatever, good. Um, but he was also tidy and neat, you know, and it just like when you would, I, I would watch him sometimes and he would just so like, if he was eating, he would just so deftly 
use his utensils and everything. And when he woke up in the morning, he had his routine where he'd fold the Kleenex and clean his glasses and then put his teeth in. And, and um, he was just very methodical and logical about everything he did. And and he just taught me so much. It, it was really amazing. And, um, and, and one of the interesting things is that my dad... Uh, he really wanted me to be aware that that I was not he was not going to outlive me. And when I was younger, before I had problems, he prepared me for to be able to be independent um, by teaching me a lot about carpentry and photography and different things like that. And um, I've actually had full time jobs doing those sort of things uh, when I needed to. And and they carried me through to uh, to be able to do other things that uh, that I wanted to do, like you know the schizophrenia society, and I'm also an avid photographer, um, which I sometimes get paid for. Uh, but my my dad just like his, his mannerisms, his customs, his his routines, um, and and his vast storehouse of knowledge about life was was just amazing. And what made it even more amazing was that. Um, he had only gone to grade six in school. He was signed into a, a trade apprenticeship that uh, he, he didn't particularly want. Uh, most of his childhood was when he lived in Denmark during the Nazi occupation. And um, yeah, so he, he had a tough, he had a very difficult life. And, uh, but uh, he, he made me tough, you know, in a way, with a, in a caring way wanting to wanting to help me and he definitely did do that well that's fascinating and i suppose it it um feeds you to help other people uh with your books and working with the schizophrenia society of alberta it must be a way and just a last couple of questions please do you believe because we've talked a little bit about your family and mental health do you believe it can sometimes be hereditary uh definitely it can be hereditary but not always uh studies have have shown with identical twins that if one twin has an illness like schizophrenia the other twin only has a 50 percent average uh susceptibility to the illness Mm -hmm. uh it in my in my own family uh my great grandmother uh I don't know if she was ever diagnosed. My uncle, who was raised by my great grandmother and her husband, um, said that his his father, the man who raised him, used to call his mother uh, Pinocchio crazy. And Pinocchio is where where one of the psychiatric hospitals are located. And he he told me that he believed she was uh, an untreated untreated person with schizophrenia. Um, so this went on my so. My great grandmother had this illness, had an illness, and my uncle and aunt uh, both had depression with psychosis. My mom had severe depression. Uh, I, I, you know, I couldn't tell you if she had psychosis, but I, I suspect she did because of indications of things she told me about. Um, but yeah, it it absolutely ran in my family. Uh, my sister. Uh, is very accomplished. She she has a master's degree in education, and uh, she's uh, she does so well for herself. She has a daughter and a husband, and a house in Toronto. And uh, I'm just very proud of her. Uh, but she didn't entirely escape the whole mental illness thing. Um, she saw a psychologist for years and years, and she was on medication a couple of times, but. Uh, but she really does does good for herself, mm-hmm. and and then there's my brother who has a very similar illness to mine, who who has been afflicted by by this illness. Yes, yes, yes. Because there's still research being done, but they have found that it it is often hereditary. Yeah, and I think it's important to note uh, that there are certain uh, drugs. I don't know what to call them in. In Canada now, uh, marijuana is legal, uh, but marijuana, if if used by a person, I don't know the exact facts, so I don't like to always quote them, but 
but what what the information seems to convey is that if a person under the age of 25 and at age i guess 25 is when the brain becomes fully mature but if a person under the age of 25 has chronic use of uh, marijuana uh, they increase their chances of developing an illness with psychosis greatly mm -hmm. especially if they have a family member mm -hmm. who has the illness as an illness of, with psychosis um I think one thing that's important to, to note is that uh, psychosis can exist in a person. The gene for psychosis can exist in a person, but if it's never triggered, um, they may never experience symptoms. Right. They, they can have that gene, that susceptibility. But uh, yeah, um, when I was diagnosed uh, with, with schizophrenia, uh, I was attending school. I was working a night shift job. I was living at home. I was fighting with my dad. I was under pressure to move out. I had high school. Um, all of these things came together, and I tried everything I could to try and deal with it. And it was just, it just slowly made me ill, very ill. Um, oh, and about regards to the marijuana, marijuana can definitely uh, induce psychosis if you're a chronic user, um, but also. Uh, crystal meth or methamphetamine or whatever, that can also give you a form of psychosis, and uh, and they're very they're very dangerous drugs to uh, to overuse. Mm -hmm. Even yeah. though you know, even though they've been made well, uh, marijuana has been made illegal legal in Canada. Yeah, it isn't in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, in the sixties, with the counterculture and with LSD and other, you know, psychotropic drugs that affect your vision, how you see things, your perception. It was also found to induce psychosis at times. So, wow, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know what's interesting though is uh, I've I've read a couple studies and I, I read. Uh, have you read uh, Spare by uh, Prince Harry? Um, I I. I chuckle only because no the less I <laughs> oh not everybody supports the monarchy but i read it out of interest and then just because a lot of people were reading it and talking about it yeah uh, but there was a point where he took some he had come back from afghanistan or whatever he was he was dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder and he took some mushrooms psychedelic mushrooms and he found they helped him Mm. And um, I so I sort of looked into it a bit further. Uh, some of the psychedelics, if if properly taken in a therapeutic dose with the help of a counselor who's going to be by your side and guide you, some of them uh, can effectively be used as a treatment. Absolutely. And um, you know the hallucinations they they will analyze your hallucinations in the way they analyze dreams and things like that but uh yeah I, I found it kind of interesting i actually had a friend uh who had a, a long and prestigious career in the royal canadian mounted police the rcmp and uh she she took early retirement um she had ptsd and uh bipolar disorder and of all the people i, I figured she would be the last one but she actually uh ended up being treated for her illnesses with uh, ketamine mm -hmm. yeah and um very effectively and and she she sees it as a, a miracle drug and uh yeah so it just um you know i drug, drugs aren't really good or bad i i guess you know it just depends on on how you use them you know uh, um yeah absolutely like, Yes, no, I agree. And I'm all for the psilocybin uh, yes. research that's being done here in the UK. There's a lot of hospitals uh, who are actively working with it and people with uh -huh. depression and schizophrenia. Yeah. Good results being, being shown and seen through those trials. So, yes, absolutely. Well, Leif, I mean, this has been absolutely fascinating. Uh, <laughs> I, I so much value you coming on to the show and just giving us all 
a view, an overview of what life is like, that you can self-care, that you can get better, and that you can have some type of semblance with life, some type of connection with everyday mm -hmm. life, and that it's not a, a, a death sentence or, you know, that, that everything is over with. And you, I think you approve of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing with us today. And viewers, listeners, all the links to Leaf's books will be in the show notes. Also, go to his website as well. That one is www.edmontonwriter.com. And for those of you who live in London, Edmonton is spelled the same as the Edmonton part of London, um, except we named a city about it here, after it here. Um, so edmontonwriter.com. And I have a lot of information there. Uh, I keep a blog on, on that website. And um, if you go there, uh, I'm a huge fan of London. Once again, you'll realize this when you see my website. Uh, if you There's a picture of the Tower Bridge. And if you click on that, it'll take you to a page where you can either read this book online for free or download it in a PDF format, totally free. And uh, this is just something that, just something that I do. And uh, yeah, and uh, there's ways to contact me in on the site if if anybody uh, wanted a signed book or if they wanted uh, to have me write for them or appear on their podcast, they'd be more than happy to do so. Uh, uh, I actually had two articles published in the British Journal of Psychiatry. Wow. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, thank you. Um, yes, thank you. And I hope, you know, in the future you come back and talk to us again and just I share. would very much like that. That would be wonderful. Thank you for joining me today. Be sure to like, subscribe, and comment and share the video on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow on your favorite social media platform. See you soon.